the most profound is that uh, this couple, this man and woman, have uh, brought forth a new life. And when birth happens the way God meant it to happen, which I believe is at home amongst, you know, some good attendants that you know very well, and that the baby is delivered by the father. It's an incredibly touching moment. And only two weeks ago, my son had the, the beautiful um, opportunity to be able to do that. And I just think it's tragic that this is robbed of so many couples. And it often comes through fear, fear that something terrible might happen. But it's, uh, birth is a, a natural experience. And I read a book recently about a midwife who'd been in Auschwitz, the on concentration camp in, in Germany, and she delivered 2,000 babies, sorry, 3,000 babies in two years, and did not lose a baby. Now this is in shocking conditions. This is in the women were suffering from extreme malnutrition. The, the environment was far from clean, and yet this midwife didn't lose a baby. And I think of how many births seem to go wrong, or, you know, babies that are died in, in childbirth. And when the statistics are considered, it's usually intervention or uh, intervening too early instead of just letting nature take its course. And I believe that a couple should be very well educated on what birth is, how the baby is born, and also to have a trust in God that this is a natural process because we are all what we are today um, partly because of our birth experience. I'll give an example of my um, my grandson's married and his wife are expecting a baby and she's very fierce, fearful and had a fever and rushed to hospital and we were we were so concerned about what will happen with the birth. And my daughter gave her a book to read on natural birth. Well, praise be to God, this young couple have just decided to hire a midwife and have a home birth. You see, it's knowledge. Knowledge is power. Now, birth is tough. That's why I think it's called labor. It's very hard work. And I think this hard work prepares the parents for some hard work ahead and the Bible says in in Proverbs 22 verse 5 train up a child in the way he should go and when he was is old he will not depart from it and the only way parents can successfully train their children is if they be united and that that being united should really happen even before conception that they come to an agreement on how they're going to birth, how they're going to raise. It's not just the food, not just the house, the environment, but the, the parents being united has everything to do with successfully raising a child. I'll give you a very important point, and, and there's one verse in the Bible, it's found in Ephesians 5.33. It says, Nevertheless, let every one of you so love his wife as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Just a small verse, just a very short one, mm -hmm. but it actually says fathoms. And that that verse is the basis of all successful parenting in that the, the, wife, the wife reverence her husband. That means she has great respect for her husband mm -hmm. and the, the husband that he love his wife. It doesn't tell the wife to love her husband because women just love. Women are usually of a softer, more gentle nature and men like the Husband means house band. They're the, they're the warrior. They're the protector of the, of the home. And sometimes men can be so busy 
concentrating on this that they forget to love their wives, to be tender to their wives. They should tell their wife every day that she is beautiful, that, that he loves her. And oh, that will do so much to help the wife reverence her husband. So it really is a two-way thing. I, I became a mother at the age of 23 and I ended up giving birth to six children and I had the great advantage of being brought up in a Christian home and being one of five children. <clears throat> second eldest, eldest girl, so my mother used to call me the second little mother. I did a lot to help with my little sisters and I just loved my baby sister who was born when I was eight and I really think a lot of parenting skills are learnt when, when we're a child. My first husband, the father of my six children, he was one of eight children and it was also a happy home and I loved going to their house for family get-togethers because there were children everywhere. There were adults everywhere and, and everyone just fitted in. And that was, that was very, very nice. And the blessing was that we were both raised very similar and we both raised our children very similar. And we were, we were born in the 50s, raised in the 60s. And um, there was an old saying, children should be seen and not heard. Now, some people do not like this saying, but I, I quite like it because it's far better for children to listen. They learn a lot when they're listening. And yes, we should listen to our children, but they shouldn't be the vocal point in, in many conversations. It is better for them. It is better for them to learn. And so... Coming in on a very, uh, a fairly level ground certainly helped with my first husband and I parenting skills. We were both psychiatric nurses. We'd both been uh, trained in, you know, in, in the dealing, especially at the hospital where I trained at, there was a emotionally disturbed children's ward. Mm -hmm. And we, I learnt a lot um, working on that ward too and I saw children come in in a terrible state, emotional state, and I just saw little by little them, them begin to heal just because they were, they were treated well. There were, there were firm rules in the ward but there was also tenderness. So I guess my parenting skills were all developed from this and then at the age of 26, I became a Christian. And when I became a Christian, um, my whole world turned around. I stopped drinking and taking marijuana and my mind became clear and I wanted God's way. I wanted to raise my children as, as God would have them. At that age, <clears throat> my youngest was three, my other child was five. And being so little children, we'd already raised them in, in firm but, you know, tender guidelines. Well, I think even before I became a Christian, what was very important was obedience. And both my, my first husband and I being raised in a home with a lot of children, obedience was very, very important and disobedience was fairly swiftly um, dealt with. There were consequences and I have found that that's really God's way of uh, raising children is there's always a consequence and no matter what we do through life, no matter who we are, where we work, there's always a consequence. So it's the uh, kindest way to raise children, really, is that there's always a consequence to every action. What I also wanted to develop in my children was 
the wonderful gift of service. So from a very young age, we taught our children to help. We taught them to um, keep their rooms tidy, to pick up their toys. We taught them to um, clear the table after the meal, to set the table before the meal, to have them helping me in the kitchen, to help me gather the kindling for the fire, to help in the garden. And it alarms me today, I see so many parents not teaching their children to work. Not, and when you work, you really serve because that's what work is, you're doing a service. And the younger you teach your children, the easier it is, because children, if left to themselves, they just want to play all day. Mm -hmm. But I have found that children do love to help. When you don't teach a child to work, you deprive them of the joy of accomplishment. And that's one of the beauties of work, is, is feeling the reward or seeing the reward of what your work was able to achieve. I wanted to see um, also in my children um, self-reliance and also an ability to um, entertain or occupy themselves. And if left to themselves, children will naturally do this. Children, I think, today are too entertained. And a little girl said to me recently, are you ever lonely? I said, I'm never lonely. She said, are you ever bored? I said, never. I'm never bored. A.A. A. Milne, the poet, famous poet, he said, the world is full of so many things, we should all be as happy as kings, which just shows that an internal restlessness often comes from um, a person who has no direction, no goals, whereas work and service, they certainly teach that. I very much wanted my children to love and to know God, and I think that's paramount. We always had evening <coughs> and morning worship. And I think that's very important. And what I did with my children, I always took morning worship. My first husband was not a Christian. And we always had a few hymns. And, you know, I would hear the children through the day humming those hymns. It's lovely to put these tunes in their head. And in the evening, each child had a, had a turn of having evening worship. They could choose the song, and an evening it might be a little scripture song. Um, they could choose the story, and usually of an evening we would do a character building story or a story from the life of Jesus, and they would say the prayer. And I have found that it does a lot for children to give them responsibility. And oh, they loved um, being able to plan the evening worship. I probably would let them begin that from the age of even four. And if it was at the age of four and they weren't quite reading yet, then they could have an older child help them. They would say the prayer, they would choose the story. And the older child might read the story. The first lessons to teach really is regularity and routine. And that probably first comes with feeding. So I would feed my babies, probably at first I would feed them too early, and then by three months, maybe two, two three months, it's eased out to, uh, to three early. And my babies used to fall asleep when they fed in the morning, usually fall asleep when they fed in the afternoon and I would lay them down. I found that children love routine. So doing the same things at the same time every day, it's almost as if it gives them a security because they know what's coming and what's next. My babies rarely cried. 
I think that if a baby cries, there, there may be something wrong. And if a mother has her baby near her most of the time, she can prevent a lot of crying. If the baby's fed, if the baby's bathed, if the baby's changed, if the baby is put to sleep on time, babies rarely cry. If a baby cries, there, there must be something wrong. Yes. So <coughs> then you would begin to investigate. Um, sometimes the baby would react to the milk because the baby might be allergic to something that the mother's eating. <clears throat> and often it's usually uh, milk, milk products, and sometimes it can be the hybridised wheat of today sometimes cabbage, onion or garlic um, can upset a little. So what? there's a little bit of trial and error for the mother to see what, what works best. And most nursing mother associations do suggest what I have just suggested. If the baby has what is often called colic or a little bit of an upset in the afternoon. Now, one of my babies had this particularly. She was my fourth baby, and she was a 10-pound baby, so it was a little bit of a squeeze um, <laughs> giving birth to her. She was a home birth, and I birthed her mostly in the water. And that little baby was a lot, was, was upset quite a bit. So I used to put the baby in a sling and carry the baby a lot. And I also had to make some massive adjustments to my eating. And I found that chamomile tea, she had a little dummy. I think sometimes people call it a pacifier. And I would just dip that in all through the day, dip it in the chamomile tea. So she'd get little drops all through the day. And that made a huge difference. So I do understand sometimes there are babies like my fourth baby who had a slightly difficult birth maybe because it was a bit of a squeeze. Whereas my next baby <clears throat> um, and my baby before that, you know, I hardly had ever a cry out of them. So um, again, if, if a baby is crying a lot, you need to investigate because it shouldn't quite be. There's a lot of controversy about this. So I'm gonna use history and common sense here. Mm -hmm and also my personal experience. When, when my daughter Emma was only six weeks old, she got whooping cough and was hospitalised for six weeks. She got so severe she had to be resuscitated at one point. And the nurse that resuscitated her, he's a male nurse, he and I became quite good friends. I'm 23, he's 38. He was in charge of the malabsorption syndrome ward in Sydney's biggest children's hospital. And he told me that a lot of children in that ward had malabsorption syndrome because they were fed starch too early. Now this had quite an effect on me. So, and then I began to investigate and I discovered that traditionally babies were not fed food until they were almost two. And then I looked at the teeth, and the first teeth at the four, four at the top, four at the bottom, and they're called milk teeth, because that's all babies should have. But by then, when the teeth come, the baby's starting to sit, the baby can feed themselves. That's, so I call it taste time. You give them a piece of cucumber, or a piece of apple, or a piece of pear. And a lot of it will go everywhere. Little bits might get in, but that's fine, because it's taste time. So the teeth appear between seven and a half, maybe up to 12 months, those, those teeth are coming in. And at about 14 months, then the molars appear. <laughs> They're the grinders, mm -hmm. and we grind grain. And then I discovered that the glands in the mouth release tylen, which is a salivary amylase that breaks down starch. They're not, that's not released until until the molars are through. So babies should not have starch until the molars are fully through. This is such a misconception today. 
parents are told to give their baby rice cereal, which is pure starch, at six months of age. And the mother's told, if you give this to the baby at night, they'll sleep through the night. I say, yes, the baby will sleep through the night because it's knocked out, because it's got this lump in its stomach it can't digest. And so I never gave my babies food until they could sit, until they could feed themselves and had a couple of teeth, then it was taste time. Mm -hmm. And not until the molars were through, that might be 18 to 20 months of age, only then did I give them cereals or breads or legumes. And I look at my babies today, <clears throat> they're all adults, <laughs> and giving birth to their own babies, they're strong, they're, they're intelligent, they're musicians, they excelled at everything that they did. Now my son James, my second born, he was not interested in food till he was 16 months of age. And he was not interested in food till he, you know, and, and then I realized till he had his molars. So he was this little boy running around and he'd never eaten food. And some people will say, he will be malnourished. Well, James definitely wasn't malnourished. He grew strong. He looks like a bodybuilder today. He's a master builder. He's an incredible musician on the panpipes. He certainly didn't suffer. And yet many children do suffer by in being introduced to food too young. Some people say, my baby's grabbing for the food. I say, they'll grab for anything. <laughs> so... I, it was easy because I never made baby food. So easy. <laughs> so the first foods, I always introduce raw food. So a piece of apple, piece of cucumber, celery, carrot. And they're teething at that stage. So those hard foods are, are nice on their gums. I've also read some dentist reports saying that people's teeth and gums don't, and jaws don't develop properly because they're just given slop soft food, whereas the jaws and the gums and the teeth, they should have these hard foods. And so probably by about 12 months, I would steam a piece of cauliflower, a piece of broccoli, a piece of carrot, and I would put it on their tray and they would see the color, they would taste the taste. I never mashed all the food up together. And remember what we're aiming for the child to be is independent to be as self-reliant as possible. So when you do this, the child is feeding themselves. They're investigating the different colors, the different tastes. By the 20 months, they're, uh, they're probably, and by two, they're eating everything we eat. So they just eat what we eat. Mm -hmm. From a very young age, you can do this. I'll tell you something that happened with my little grandson. He was allergic to his mother's milk because <laughs> she was eating foods he was allergic to. So they put him on goat's milk, so he's bottle fed. He's 10 months. I visit and my daughter-in-law puts the bottle in his mouth and puts him on the lounge. And I said, can I feed the baby? Because I think even if the baby's bottle fed, you must hold them. You must talk to them. And they love it when you talk to them. So I'm feeding him saying, you are so beautiful. You are the most beautiful. And he started to push me. He started to pinch me. So I put my head away and I kept it away. And what does that baby want? He wants me to say, you are so beautiful. So about 30 seconds I had my head away. Then I turned around and I smiled. Now the smile tells him, I love you. My face being away just told him I did not like what he was doing. Now this happened three times in that feed. And the fourth time, I kept my head away for a minute. Oh, he did not like that. And when I came back, I smiled. The smile says, I love you. Do you know, he never did it again. So can you see that you're teaching guidelines and obedience from a, from a, very, from a very young age? May I say, too, that I never fed my children between meals. Mm -hmm. So I own even little ones. They only ate when we sat to eat. And it's such a temptation for mothers to give their little ones bits of food all day to keep them quiet, to keep them happy. 
but I never did that because then they don't eat at their meal. And then they don't, and then because they didn't eat their meal, then they're starting to get hungry within a couple of hours. Then they want something to eat. It's a, it's a, a vicious cycle. And so the rules of the home were you, you stay at the table. You stay at the table. Breast milk yep. digests very quickly. And when they're being partly breastfed and partly food, they don't need much at the meal table because they were breastfed. Mm -hmm. Well, the gu guidelines in showing the, ch the little one that there are things they can do and there are things they can't do. They can't pull at the wires on the tel television or the technology. They can't, um, you know, there are some areas that a child cannot go. So what I would do, I would say no, and then I would take them over to another area. And if they crawl back, I'd say no and I'd take them away and put them to another area. And maybe the third time, if they try and do it again, and a little chopstick's good, you just tap them on the, on the hand hard so it stings, and they cry. And you, take, and you say, you can't touch that, and take them away. Now, a lot of children will learn by being moved, but some children with a perhaps stronger will they need that little sting to, <coughs> to do that. And my, I had a lady say to me once, oh, I get so upset with my husband when my little one, you know, a situation like that is trying to pull at the cords. He, he smacks the little one on the hand. She said, he smacked my baby. I said, you must stop that. You must stop that immediately. Now, what she's doing is she's being irreverent to her husband. Now, her husband knows if that little one puts his teeth through those electrical cords, you know, he could do far more damage to himself than the smack on the hand. And she was taken back by what I said. I said, your, your husband's showing a kindness to your little one, and your little one needs to see that you support him in that. And look, this is happening... If, when a baby now, if this isn't if this isn't dealt with as a baby, and I'm not talking about the baby, you, you train the baby. I'm talking about the parents being in, being united. That's that's of the utmost importance. And a lot of women don't realise they're being irreverent to their husband when when they don't support him. See what what you'll find with little ones, um, you talk less. The less talk, the better and its consequences, its consequences. And so it's very important, I taught from an early age, when I call, the child must come. If I call and the, and the little one does not come, then there's a consequence. And something that children hate, they hate having to sit on a stool in a corner for five minutes. In fact, Super Nanny, she was a very famous nanny that taught child training, she said, Age plus one, so the three-year-old sits on the stool for four minutes. The, the four-year-old sits on the stool for five minutes. They do not like that, to sit on a stool in a corner. And if they get up, then you start the stopwatch again. <laughs> but there, there must be a consequence. And if the consequence doesn't hurt, they'll just do it again. Well, this small one about the, the, the smack on the hand and... It, it's more than a tap because if it doesn't sting, the child, you know, the child doesn't get the message. And that might be a crawling baby. Now, one lady said, my child bit, so I bit him back. But I don't agree with that because you're trying to stop them biting and that you've bitten. So I'll tell you what I did with my son Peter. He bit me when he was feeding. He was... 10 months old, <coughs> that hurts. When a child sucks, they use their tongue and their top lip. So for a child to bite, they have to pull their tongue in and physically, you know, choose to do that. Now, Peter was not being naughty. Peter was just trying something out. But I must show him it's unacceptable. So I quickly put him down on the floor and I walked out of the room and, oh, did he cry? I waited a minute 
And then I came in and I said to Peter, will we try again? So this is, this is just a baby, but they, they read you. <laughs> they read you very well. I did not pick him up until he'd stopped crying. Now, if he'd fallen and scraped his leg, of course I'd pick him up straight away. But this is different. So I said, stop, stop, stop your crying. And as soon as he made an effort to stop, I, <coughs> I pick him up and I start feeding him again and I'm smiling. And the smile says, I love you. Me walking out of the room and just stopping the feed told him there was something unacceptable here. As he's feeding, I'm smiling. And my attention is taken by another child. He's my fifth child, so there's lots of children. And I notice he stopped sucking. So I quickly looked at him and I said, yes. And I looked him straight in the eye and he started sucking again. And he never bit me again. So if a child bites another child, um, there must certainly be a consequence. The child must sit on a stool, sit in a corner, and when they've stopped crying, then you bring them over, you get some cream, and get them to put the cream on the child that they've bit, bitten, and then they must apologise. So there must be a consequence. If you consequence quickly, swiftly, and straight away, I have found it won't happen again. I like the idea that the punishment fits the crime. As I just told you, with if a child bites another child, there, there must immediately be a consequence. The child must be put aside and sat on a stool. That's their consequence. And then when the time's up and they've stopped crying, then they must see what they have done and see how they've, caught, they've caused pain and, and put some cream on the wound, as I said, and apologise. And if they say no, I won't, you know, if they won't apologise, they sit back on the stool for another four or five minutes, then we try again. But you keep at it, you keep at it because there must be a consequence. So I like punishment fits the crime, but for obedience or if a child harms another child, there must be a very swift consequence. I, I never, I never let any of my children fight. I, ne I never let them hurt each other. I was very swift on consequences there. If I heard voices raised with my two children, you know, or, or between two children, I would <coughs> drop everything and I would run. And I would say, what's, what's happening? So my children knew straight away that was totally unacceptable. You don't do that. And, he, and one would say, he did this, why did you do that? He did this, why did you do that? And I would, I would resolve it and they had to hug each other and apologise. They did not like that. But see, there must, must be a consequence. Now, my children could debate and we could discuss an issue, but they were never allowed to yell and they were never allowed to be unkind. And sometimes, if I heard voices raising, I'd run in, I'd sit in front of them and I'd say, be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. I often used to say that. And that would just calm them. But I think that it's nice to have um, soft hymns singing in the background or orchestral hymns. That gives a really nice tone, tone to the area, tone to the environment. Now this takes work, but I have to tell you, we never had fights in our home. And it worked very, very well. And so the results that I saw told me that we're on the right track. And when I became a Christian and began to read God's Way for Training Children, it was a confirmation to me that that we're on the right track as well. Corporal punishment is a um, is has often been misused, and I think that's why so many parents today are against it. And I certainly don't agree with beating the living daylights out of a child. No, no, no. 
Um, and if parents are not comfortable with corporal punishment, I, I understand that. Sometimes they're not happy because they were beaten as children. But unfortunately, many parents who've been through this go to the other extreme and are totally indulgent with their child and there's never any consequences. And that's why I think it's important to use the, the uh, rule that punishment fits, <clears throat> fits the crime, but there must be swift consequences for <clears throat> disobedience. If the punishment doesn't cause pain, the child will do it again. Now, pain may be having to sit on a chair or a stool for five minutes. Uh, pain may be they, are, they cannot have their friend over. Um, it, it may be that they, they are <clears throat> don't have their free time that afternoon. Uh, it depends on the child. And I'll tell you an amusing story about my friend and her little boy used to ride his motorbike every weekend. He was only about 10. And, it, and most afternoons he would play with his friend. And he always came home late. He always came home at 20 past five and he was supposed to be home at five. So in her frustration as to what to do, she said to him, okay, you choose the punishment. What is going to be the punishment if you, come, if you don't come home at five o'clock? And he said, I can't ride my bike on the weekend. She said, okay. The next afternoon, it was 10 past five, and she heard this crying and crying, and she looked out the window, and here was her son walking down the hill, crying and crying, because he knew he'd lost his bike riding on the weekend. <laughs> Sometimes kids are tougher on each other than, than the parent is. One lady said to me, my little girl is seven and she can have the phone, my phone, for one hour every Sunday. <clears throat> but she said, I see her picking up the phone through the week. I said, it's very easy. Every time your little girl picks up the phone through the week, she loses five minutes on her Sunday viewing. That will quickly fix the problem. So you can see by what I've um, explained to you, there's, there's, there's always consequence. <clears throat> and every parent chooses the consequence um, with what they're most comfortable with. I rarely smacked my children, rarely. Hardly ever, I can hardly remember, but I started from this age and there was always a consequence. Whereas my husband, Michael, he, he used the stick with his children and, they, and he never hid in anger. And that's where most parents that do smack their children make the mistake. You should never hit in anger. If a child has done wrong and they know they're gonna get a smack because they've done wrong, they've been disobedient or they crossed the line, then the parents should say, I'm so sorry you've chosen the smack, here's the smack. They smack, it must be hard, it must hurt or it's useless and there's not emotion with it. So really every parent has to choose what, what, their, what, you know, what the uh, consequences or the punishment should be. My sister's a ballerina, she's a very elegant woman, she had four children. And a, her girlfriend said to her one day, Fiona, you know, I don't believe in smacking and I smack my children all day long. You believe in smacking, but I've never seen you smack your child. She said, oh, I always give them a choice. <laughs> in other words, when they cross the line, uh, that's their choice. Parents should never raise their voices to their children. Never. There is never a time that you should raise your voice. Maybe the only time is when they're down the field and you're calling them. If you raise your voice to your children, they will raise their voices to you. So I'm in my daughter's home in Wisconsin. She has seven children. The youngest is three, the next one is five, the next one is 12, twin girls are 18, and then a 20-year-old and a 22-year-old. 
And those little ones are very challenging to Emma. And I've been there sometimes for a week at a time. Never have I heard her raise her voice. Never. Never. And yet I've seen her challenge to the utmost. Mm -hmm. She never raises her voice. And God can do that for a mother. Because when you raise your voice, when you yell at a child, you're actually saying to the child, I don't like you. You must remain calm at every step. I read where Ellen White said if she felt herself getting annoyed, she would go out of the room and she would not speak until she knew that, again, she was under control. Well, what, what we started, <coughs> and I see with our little grandchildren, they always help to set the table. You know, from two, from 18 months, they can get the forks out and put them on the table and they can get the, the, the knives out. And we all, and every Friday night, it was a, a, um, a tradition, I suppose, the grandchildren would massage Pa's feet. So Michael would put his feet up and my little grandchildren, they started when they were about two and he would say, oh, that feels so good. And when you say that, of course, that encourages the child very much. And they look at me and I'll, I'd go, Pa's happy. <laughs> and they would massage his feet. And then they heard about how the guests like massaging their feet. So I said to them one day, would you like to, to massage the guests' feet? And they looked at me as if, could we? Because the guests are very important people in their eyes. And so every Saturday morning, I would take the little boys over. I think they were three, five and eight at this stage. And the guests just were so happy that these little boys were massaging their feet. And the little boys loved it because the people loved it. And sometimes they'd slip them a little bit of money or a little, you know, help. So can you see it just, service just feeds. The more you serve, the more results. And, and then you get the feeling of, accomplishment, <coughs> that beautiful feeling of helping someone. From Fine. one until two years, before they get out of the bath, they pick everything up on the edge of the bath. Even as soon as they can walk, when you've changed their nappy, we call it a nappy or diaper, you roll it up and you give it to them and they put it in the bin. And they help to um, <coughs> put the clothes away and you show them where they go. So you have them with them. And I used to get in the shower to, to scrub the shower, and I'd give them all a little scrubber, and they'd be in there with me scrubbing the shower from, from the age of two, from a very young age. I would always have them with me, have them with me working, weeding in the garden. And the two-year-old can't really discern what's the weed and what's the flower, but often they'll get happy with just playing with rocks or playing with worms. You know, it's the best toys for children. And when my grandchildren used to come in the garden with me, Lennox was three, <coughs> Sophia was five, and whenever they'd see me in the garden, they'd run down to the vegetable garden. And I'd give them a little section themselves, and they'd dig and they'd make little sections, and then they'd cut them cut the uh, turmeric leaves and make little beds and oh they were so happy just to be in the garden and we used to well we used to dig out the nut grass which is a horrible grass it's got a nut and then a thread then another nut then a thread and so we're digging deep and then we'd sing deep deep as the ocean we'd sing that at the top of our voice looking for these nuts and then whenever we'd get the nut, we'd sing the hallelujah chorus. So you can see you're teaching <coughs> the children the hand of God in everything they do and how that nut grass is like sin. You've got to get those, you've got to get those, those weeds out. And song is a lovely thing. 
<clears throat> to the Children Love song. I didn't accomplish much less because I just kept at it. <laughs> I just kept at my my work and but I'd be talking to them, I'd look at them, I'd laugh at them, but I'm still working. And the fact that I notice them, the fact that I'm engaged with them, and I was watching your mum the other day weeding with Jaden, and she was chatting away to him and he had some worms, but she was weeding a lot. It didn't stop her. So if you incorporate in it, actually doesn't that take that much less time. So what I would do with my children, they were always with me. And, but they'd be with me in the garden, they'd be with me in the kitchen. And <coughs> because they were always with me, sometimes they'd wander away and play with their cars and play with their blocks. And of course I was very happy to see that because they're occupying themselves. So you, uh, I think it's very important that you know, if a child wants to be all white with the, all the time with the mother, well, work with the mother. <laughs> work with them. And then after a while, the child might want to go away a little bit, and they can. But, it's a, but I think that's the way that you teach them to occupy themselves, is you have them with you. And then little by little, they'll often wander away. It is very point. difficult when the father and the mother work I, I never wanted to do that. I felt that raising my children was the most important work that I think that God has given to humans because it is our role to mould these little minds after the, after the pattern of Jesus. And as Deuteronomy says, here a little, there a little. When you rise up, when you walk by the wayside, and if other people are raising your children, that that can't happen. I used to say to my friends, I would rather live in a tent in a field and have my children with me. I think this is something that the parents, it's important for them to discuss um, before they have children. And I know um, <clears throat> my husband Michael, he said that his first wife wanted to go back to work when the youngest was six weeks old and he said, well, I will raise the children. He didn't want anyone else raising the children. So he came home and he raised the children. And as a man and a worker, he never entertained the children, but he had them always with him. And, and he was building. And so his little boy would get little blocks of wood and they were his cars. And his little girl would get a bigger block of wool and wood and wrap it in a little cloth and it was her baby. <laughs> that they, children will naturally play. Um, but I think that the children that want to be entertained is because they've always been entertained. If my children wanted to be entertained, it was with me working. Um, with responsibility is from a very young age, I, I taught my children to work and be responsible for their cars, be responsible for putting their diaper in the bin um, and when they finish their meal to take it over and rinse it and put it, well we never had a dishwasher. And also from a young age I had them up at the sink with me um, to help helping with washing the dishes and I would have them in the kitchen with me. <clears throat> Say we're making an apple pie, I would peel the apples, I would core the apples and then I would give it to them and they would have a knife, even from two. And I would say to the little one, don't cut your finger because I don't want blood in the apple, okay? And they would smile, but it would just help them to be aware because I don't think that it helps to say, be careful, be careful, that, that, that really doesn't help them. And, and I wouldn't give them the sharpest knife in the drawer, but it was a knife that could, could cut the apple. So you see, there's a responsibility. And then when we serve the pie, um, I say, when Pa comes in to eat his meal and all the grandchildren are there, I say, this pie for lunch, I peel them and Lennox chop them. And, and so I would go over. And you see, there's not a pride in them, but there's just a joy that they contributed 
to this pie and then pa is always served first. I don't think children should ever be served first. <laughs> they should be taught to reverence and respect the older people. They are to wait as children until the adults have been served, then the children can. The most beautiful way to explain God is through nature and also the Bible stories. The Bible friends are a beautiful set, beautifully illustrated. So my Bible friends that I have at home are falling apart a little bit. But I read them to all my children. I read them to, to, um, to my grandchildren. In fact, Lennox, my little grandson, recently discovered the story of Jonah. Oh, he loved the story of Jonah. And, of course, they loved the story of David. It's the story of Joseph, how this young man stood firm for God. And little boys love to see strengths, <clears throat> like in Daniel and the lion's den. And then I see a little later that little Lennox has found all the lions that I've got in the house, the African wooden lions, the little plastic lions, and he's got them all there. And I have a wooden angel, and he's got the wooden angel there, and it's protecting Daniel from the lion's den. And the children are little mimickers, you know, they, they repeat and, and want to play those games. And Lennox and Sophia, their, their parents aren't Christians, so they only learn about God in my home. And then I saw Lennox get a piece of wood, and he had some paper, and he stuck the paper on the wood and he said, look, Nana, I've made an angel. <laughs> so the Bible stories and through nature and show them what a wonderful God we serve and look at the beautiful things that he made. And what I often used to do, <clears throat> we'd go for a walk and I'd sing the song, shall we go for a walk today to see what God has given us? What can you find that God has given you? And also to pray at night before they go to bed. Just before they go to bed is such a precious time. And, and all my grandchildren, I always go in and pray with them. So this is how you can weave God. And it's nice to be able to weave it into every part of their life. I saw a mother one day while the children were playing feeding the child while they were playing. I don't agree with that. I find that if a child only drinks between meals, um, they're usually hungry at mealtime. And if a child is fussy, I question why they are fussy. Because when a child is 18 months old, they'll eat a caterpillar, they'll eat dirt, they'll eat anything. So what happens that a child becomes fussy? And I think it's because they're introduced to chocolates and lollies and pizza. And if you give a child a choice of a lollipop or an apple, of course they're going to choose the lollipop. So my children never had pizza, unless I made it sometimes. They never had chocolates and things like that. So at the mealtime, we just sat and ate. But I always started with the raw food first. At breakfast they'd start with cut up fruit, at lunch they'd start with a salad and then we'd, we'd bring out the cooked food. So when the Bible says train up a child in the way he should go, this is also talking about eating. And so it's very important to, uh, to serve the right food, to serve the best food, to serve the nourishing food. And this is where the parents must be united on this. And of course that needs to be worked out early in the piece. And um, if a father wants to give the child biscuits or lollies between the meals, then, then, then the mother needs to say to the husband, uh, we need to have a chat. <laughs> and dialogue with the father and you know, and it's common sense. If the child has that between meals, they're not going to eat their vegetables. If they don't eat their vegetables, their body's not going to get the nourishment. 
So that, that's an important thing. But if a child does not want to eat, um, make sure they don't have anything to eat between meals. And when <laughs> they sit at the table, they must stay there. They must stay there until the meal has finished. And what if they don't want to eat? I'd say, that's all right, but you must stay there. And then you don't give them any attention and everyone eats. And you know what you find? Often they'll start eating. So it's important not to make a fuss of the food. Mm-hmm. And also um, let the child choose. They can choose between an avocado or a tomato they can choose between cabbage or lettuce. They can't choose between pizza and lentils. You know, the common sense is needed there. But, you know, I find that if the food's attractive and children love dipping, make a dip, make a hummus dip or an avocado dip. And most children love raw carrot and raw celery and dipping it in there. You have that on the table first. And then the fruits and the vegetables, the nuts, the grains, the legumes... There's everything that God designed necessary for the human body. It's the best. It's the Garden of Eden diet. And I've certainly found that in my life. There are cultures that prove that. You know, the Blue Zone is a book written on people that live long lives and they found that a lot of them were vegetarians. Some of them, if they ate meat, it was only a very small part of the diet, like on festive occasions. I just had an email today. A lady said, my child's six months old and not sleeping through the night, still waking four times. I wrote back and said, that's perfectly normal. So did my babies. My baby started sleeping through the night from about two, two and a half. So I just slept with my babies. And if they woke, I just stuck them on and went back to sleep. And not every mother is comfortable with this. So my daughter just has a little cot right next to her bed. So if her baby wakes, she can just pull the baby in, feed the baby. Then when the baby falls asleep, put the baby back. Um, You have to do what you're comfortable with. One lady was happy to sleep with the baby, but the husband wasn't happy. And I always say to the mothers that sleep with their babies, you must give your husband a few hours in bed without a baby. So I always fed my baby to sleep and then laid them in their little bed and then my baby would wake maybe four hours later, maybe three hours later. So husband is number one and that's how the, how the woman reverences her husband. Her children and her husband must know that the husband is number one. So one lady, her husband did not like the baby in bed, so she would feed the baby to sleep, put the baby in the little bed, be with the husband for half the night. Then when the baby wake, she just went into another room and slept the rest of the night with the baby. So it's just whatever works. Because I slept with my baby, I was not tired. I, I slept well, but I would go to bed early. So I would try and be, be in bed by nine. I also think it's important to put the children to bed early so that the husband and wife have a few hours without children in the evening maybe 6.30 or 7. My daughter-in-law, she puts her babies to bed, her little children, 6.30, and they wake up at 6.30. See, children need a lot of sleep. They need a lot more sleep than adults. There's an excellent book called Have a New Kid by Friday. So this book shows that by Friday you can have a new kid. In other words, in a few days you can change things around. And it's all about consequences. So you can, so she could even say to the child, I'm terribly sorry that I've allowed you to speak to me like this all these years, but things are changing. I'm not going to let that happen anymore. So if you speak to me like that again, uh, <clears throat> you're going to lose your iPad for the day. Um, you, uh, I don't know, you, you find the consequence. So I would, I would say, The people I'm talking to, I'd say, excuse me, and then I'd squat down eye to eye with the child and say, sweetheart, I'm not going to talk to you now. I'm talking to these people. In five minutes, I'll be finished. You are not to interrupt anymore, okay? And I would smile. So you're you're clear with it. And if he keeps interrupting, you say, 
Sweetheart, if you keep interrupting, you'll have to sit on that little stool over there for five minutes. So, it's, again, it's consequences. Mm -hmm. Well, in the book Have a New Kid by Friday, he says, say it once and leave the room. <laughs> and then the question is, but what if they don't do what you ask? There's a consequence. Mm -hmm. There's always a consequence. And, and the whole book, it's a fascinating book, it's all about consequences, the whole book. Do you know, the best, best friends that a child can have are their parents. Children don't need other children. And if there are other children around, nice. But if they're around, it should be for short times and you should be there. Because you can have a naughty child that can undo your training in an afternoon. So it's very important to protect your children against the influence of other children. What children need most is to work. What children need to do is learn service. They need to become self-reliant, self-sufficient and obedient. Other friends, it's not that important. And what happens in school today, five-year-olds talk to five-year-olds. Ten-year-olds talk to ten-year-olds. But in the homeschool where I, I homeschool my children, people used to say to me, your children talk to me because my children learnt to interact with two-year-olds, ten-year-olds, twenty-year-olds, eight-year-olds. That's the best social. You keep them with you. I'll give you an uh, example. We went to a... Um, a church one day and my youngest was 12 actually I think my oldest of the, my two youngest boys were 10 and 12 and after church I saw them, I was speaking to friends which of course is most enjoyable and then I looked over and I saw that my two boys were talking with some other boo boys who were naughty boys so I said to my friends Excuse me, I must go. My sons are in danger. And I went straight over and I smiled. And I said to the naughty boys, How are you going, boys? How's school? What are you? And I smiled the whole time. You're still, you're still riding your motorbike? And you get them chatting. And you know they like you being there because you're interested in them. So I just stay there. And another time we were at a friend's house for lunch and there are a few families there and you always have your eye where are your children you don't let them know you're watching them but you have an eye where they are and I noticed the children went around so I went out the back and there was like a van and they were in the van with other children so I just went and looked in the door big smile said hi guys and went in and just sat in the middle of them and just smiled and chat with them, how are you going? And they don't get upset and they don't get angry, but me being there means there's just a better tone. So you, you have your child with you. And I'll tell you another thing that happened. We had this little girl, she was only 18 months old, and every time she visited, she'd bite all the other children. And her mother would stand there saying, I don't know what to do with her, she bites all the other children. So whenever she'd visit, I'd go and pick up the little girl and I would just carry her the whole day because then it protected all the other children. And this little girl was so happy because no one had given her so much attention. <laughs> and then I might say, what's the biggest mistake? It's indulgence. That is the worst thing that you can do for a child is not to correct them not to allow consequences for their actions. That's the worst thing you can do. So if a parent has done, and maybe a parent might say, I'm sorry, I got really angry and I just hit my head, my child around the head. Do you know children are very forgiving? And it's, it's also praying to God, asking for forgiveness and asking for his help. And then you'd have a look, why did you get so angry? 
Is it because you're going to bed too late? Is it because you're on technology tonight? Is it because you're drinking too much coffee? Is it because you're dehydrated? So it's very important that the mother keep herself well hydrated, well slept, well nourished, and also go to God early, early in the morning, asking for wisdom and guidance through the day. And she will find that she will have more control over her emotions because the children do, that they know exactly how to annoy you and irritate you at times. So it's very important you practice smiling and you be calm and, <clears throat> and you have a consequence for every action. When a parent doesn't have a consequence for naughty behavior, it angers them, it annoys them, and then there's more naughty behavior, then they get angrier, and that's when they're, they're liable to, to do wrong. But back to the indulged child, very important that the parents get together and they work out exactly what they're going to do so that they support each other. Well, what you have to remember with step parenting is, and it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done, so I <clears throat> was a single parent for four years. It was not a difficult time because I'd done all the training when they're little. And I was so glad we had a fire in our home because that meant we had to go out and find wood. There was work we had to do. And then I became a step parent. And for the first year, my, my little stepdaughter, who was 11 when we married, she was so happy because there was very nice food and she had some sisters. But then when she started to, hormones started to change, she became very difficult. And I had to pray a lot about this. And what I used to do, I'd look for areas where I could win her affections. And the children, we always had a roster. One would wash, two would dry, one would clear the table. And one day my younger son William and Michaela were drying the dishes. And we always put the cups upright. And she wanted to put the cups standing on their head. And William said, Mum, she wants to put the cups upright. We're supposed to put them on their head. And I said, the person that dries the glass can choose whether they put it upright or downright. And he was not happy with my answer, but I could tell she was. It doesn't, doesn't matter about William. I've won him. He's my son, you know, from this age. But <clears throat> so sometimes I'd veer to the stepchild purely because I knew I, ha I had to win. I had to win the stepchild. And you've got to remember that you have this natural affection to yours, which you don't have to your stepchildren. But God in his wisdom and mercy can help you and give you wisdom there. As a friend of mine said to me once, when you correct your children, they know they've done wrong. When you correct your stepchildren, they think you're picking on them. <laughs> so it's... It's, it's not an easy road to travel, but and it, it was not always easy at all. But my stepdaughter at the age of 18, she came to me one day and she said, I just want you to know I'm so glad that Dad married you. Now, I don't think she felt like that in the first few years. <laughs> but <clears throat> you've got to remember they, they're not easy, but they, they grow up. <laughs> So this is a good question because I have experienced it all. I've experienced my first marriage where he wasn't a Christian and being single mother for four years and then my second marriage. So in my first marriage, I was very mindful to always respect and show reverence to my husband. And I found that when I did that, he supported me. And I prayed much about it. And he was very non-conformist, so he was very happy to homeschool the children. And the government homeschooling was so much work. And then friends visited, 
And my first husband really liked these friends. And they showed both my husband and I this other form of schooling, which was a Christian form, it was our accelerated Christian education. He said, it's so much easier. It's less work for the mother. And Terence agreed. I couldn't believe it. I just praise God. He even paid the check for us to join the school. I just saw that as an incredible answer to prayer. So that's how we got into the Christian correspondence um, homeschooling. And again, I was very mindful of what was important to him. And because I respected him, I paid reverence to him where I could, uh, I found that he would, he would support me. So it is not an easy road, but um, I remember one day he, um, he called me a very bad name in front of the children. He was angry about something. And I said, you are not to call me that name and I'm not going to serve you lunch because of what you've just called me. I needed the children to see that too. I needed to see... I needed for them to see that there was a line that you reverence, but you never allow for something like that. And I served all the children's meals and he sat there with an empty plate and I didn't serve him. It was very hard for me. And he sat there saying, any leftovers for me? <laughs> but I, I knew I had to make that line of distinction and he never ever um, called me that name again. Well when my children were little I just had cloth nappies and of course I washed them every day. I never covered them with plastic, I always had woolen coverings for them uh, and I do understand that today uh, a lot, most mothers are just using the disposable diapers and my daughter was able to get diapers made out of starch and and she could put these in the compost bin she could put them in the fire because they're made out of starch they were more expensive but she found that they would you know the child could do several wees in them and yet still it would be dry next to their skin but a lot of mothers today are choosing cloth and it's a lot easier than the than the big toweling <laughs> ones that I used to do with the pins either side they can be just like um like little pants with a thick cloth in the middle and washing those and I think it's important to to uh, look at that it's certainly a great saving and far better for the baby to have the cloth circumcision is a um hot topic. Um, as a back to nature hippie living in a rainforest, we never considered circumcision. And I read in Ellen White where she said once, <clears throat> one of her quotes, she said, if God's law had always been obeyed, there would never have been the need for the right of circumcision. And yet my husband, Michael, who I'm married to today, he believes that circumcision is very important. So if I was married to Michael when I had my babies <clears throat> and circumcision was very important to him, I would have submitted to that. But when my babies were little, the thought of circumcising them was a horrific thought for me to put them through that pain. But I do understand that on the eighth day the, they're not bleeding as much. So um, really, I, I just say, I leave that up to the, to the parents. Vaccination, um, I don't say leave that up. Well, of course, it's the parents' decision, but I don't agree with vaccination and I never would advise vaccination. But I'm not a one to tell someone what to do. If someone asks me, should I vaccinate their children, I say to them, well, my opinion is not, 
but you should not be making decisions on my opinion. What you need to do is investigate this. Find out what's in the vaccines. And what you'll find out is that the childhood illnesses were almost 80% wiped out before the vaccination was introduced. So why was that? Because of Florence Nightingale, an increase in hygiene, sanitation and nutrition. You see, germs multiply in filth. And so keep, keep the house clean. Keep the house clean and tidy. Give the child peak nutrition because the body has been created by God to heal itself. And it will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. If he is doing that, when keep him near you and whenever he does it, <coughs> you hold his hand and take it away and smile and say, no, you must not touch your private parts. And you can get him out of the habit. But do, do not punish him. What he's done is he's touched his private part and it felt good, so he's touched it again. So now you just need to train him out of that and say, no, no, you must not. Okay. And that's all I would say. That's a private part. Don't touch that. It, it is a, a great honour to be chosen by God to raise children and that responsibility is to mold them and form them after the likeness of God because Genesis 1.26 says that man was created in the image of God. When the Bible says train up a child in the way he should go, this is true because a child left to themselves Proverbs says they turn out to be ashamed to their parents. And training is like guiding the will. And it's just like guiding a vine around a tree. If you pull that vine, you'll break it. If you let it go wherever it wants, it'll go all over the place. And hardly ever will it go around the, the veranda pole. But the will should be gently guided and directed. So every day, guide it this way. Every day, guide it again. The will shouldn't be battered to pieces. And it shouldn't be allowed to go wherever it wants. But gently guided and directed. And that's the, that's the beautiful gift that God has given to us as parents, as grandparents, to carefully guide and direct that will. Grandparents, please don't indulge your grandchildren. Please work with the parents. So a lady said to me one day, oh, you must spoil your grandchildren. And I smiled at her because I knew she would not like my answer. But she pushed me. She said, you must spoil your grandchildren. And I said, no, no, I don't. Spoil means to ruin something beautiful. Grandparents, if you support children in the way they're raising their children, they will, they will love that. And if your children aren't raising your children, they're indulging them, well, you will have the wonderful opportunity when they're at your house to gently guide them and direct them in the right way.